Yes. So uh, now, uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor first to our first speaker, Barnaba Dorda, who is originally from Poland. Uh, he is a law graduate. He graduated from law both in Poland and here in um, and there in Ireland. I'm no longer in Ireland now. Yeah, I forgot. Uh, he is a chair of uh, Forum Polonia. Uh, and it should also be mentioned that uh, in his uh, professional work, he also organizes migrant workers into the uh, SIP2 uh, trade union. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours, Barnaba. Uh, so um, I'll share this. Do you want to share your presentation now? Uh, yes, Gali, I'll share my presentation, all right? Okay, so uh, okay. thank you very much for a nice introduction. I'm delighted to be here with uh, all of you. Uh, so I will be talking today about the Polish diaspora in Ireland um, uh, and the possible uh, opportunities for uh, cooperation with other civic stakeholders. Um, so uh, like, like, I, I will start maybe from setting the backdrop to my to my presentation about the Polish diaspora by saying that that briefly talking about the migrant cohort in Ireland, as we all know, um, Ireland was uh, rather a, an exporting country of, of, of people uh, up to the end of the 20th century. And since 2000s, there was a, a influx of uh, 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 migrants into the island. And census 2011 and census 2016 gives us some indication about the, the amount of migrants uh, in Ireland and uh, um, the board uh, shows that there is a consistent amount of the migrants uh, in this country, amounts to more than 500,000. But interesting enough, 50% uh, of those migrants in both 2011 and 2016 census are from Eastern Europe. There, around 30% are, are from the Western Europe and North America, and the rest from the, from the other countries. But the biggest uh, uh, minority in Ireland uh, is Polish diaspora. It's the amount to 122,000 uh, uh, people who seems to uh, be here for longer than perhaps initially expected. Um, and some researchers are saying that uh, there's, there might be some similarities between uh, Ireland and the other countries. Uh, where not sufficient efforts uh, were made to integrate migrants uh, because there was some overall presumption that uh, they are they are rather they will return to their own countries uh, but that census the both census gives us indication that most likely they are here to stay especially to, it, it is in relation to the Polish diaspora and uh, some of the uh, Polish organization uh, who are uh, who are involved in the integration of the Polish migrants in Ireland, their position is that there is no sufficient funds to cover uh, their activities aiming at supporting those those migrants as uh, um, um, they are technically excluded from assessing the funds. The funds mainly are targeted at the uh, uh, third, uh, third countries, uh, third, third country migrants. Uh, some other people are saying that maybe there is no need for uh, integrating uh, Poles into the uh, Irish society, society because they are predominantly white and they are quite well integrated. So when we when we can focus on the challenges for the Polish diaspora in Ireland, uh, uh, what what is shown from the different uh, data, especially through the ESRI publication reports, is that there is a predominant language barrier. Uh, many, majority of the Poles, they don't speak very well uh, English, uh, and uh, therefore they are, um, they are prevented from a proper accessing for the state services. Uh, another ESRI report uh, uh, shows that there is uh, issues at the labor market that uh, even though they might have a quite high employment, usually they're employed in the low skill, low pay job, and they are technically have difficulty with, with accessing the managerial position. Uh, and 
Furthermore, another ESRI report uh, research on the residential distribution indicated that migrants tend to cluster and live in areas uh, where private rented accommodation is plentiful. And many of them are, are living in Dublin or Limerick in Cork area. And uh, that combined with dysfunctional uh, private rented sector uh, uh, and their low income, income could lead to some problem, problematic situation in terms of the integration perspective, a cluster in the, in the, in the very expensive uh, uh, um, uh, uh, private accommodation and they might be struggling with proper living standards. At the top of it, then the COVID-19 happened and the most recent data from uh, ESRI, I think those published in, in the end of the last year, uh, shows that uh, the non-EU nationals and Western Europeans are more likely to be working in job associated with high levels of working from home, uh, or they are essential workers employed in the health service sector, for example, but Eastern European nationals like those, are much less likely to be working in these jobs uh, than Irish nationals. And as a consequence, the fall in employment was found to be much sharper for Eastern European nationals compared to the Irish nationals. Even more worrying than there's an indication that the job in employment was particularly sharp for women who are Eastern European nationals. Uh, so these are the challenges and that the top of it is as I was saying that uh, there is no sufficient resources available for a um, Polish diaspora organization who would provide some support for uh, uh, the challenges faced by the by the Polish community in Ireland. Um, I will jump right now into the kind of the very short overview of the Polish diaspora community in Ireland. And uh, uh, it is fair to say, actually, to some extent, that before 2004, all Poles who were living in 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 Ireland could be technically squeezed uh, into the Polish embassy at the Christmas party. There were not so many of them. It's changed after 2004, and right now. There's a plenty of Polish parishes in, in, in Ireland, uh, uh, plenty of Polish shops. Uh, there are some Polish solicitors, Polish medical centers. Uh, there are still two Polish newspapers people can, can get in the Polish shops, even though in the uh, digital era. Uh, right now, there's about 52 Polish Saturday complementary schools where Polish kids could learn uh, Polish language. There's also uh, uh, plenty of social media support groups uh, on the internet. Uh, so we are quite active, the Polish community uh, in Ireland. Uh, and there are also, there were also many community organizations uh, within the last two decades. And many of them are no longer in existence due to a number of reasons. But I will focus right now on the existing ones and give some examples of, 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 of them. So they could be technically grouped into three main categories, cultural, educational, and support services uh, organization. Although on many occasions, uh, many of these organizations uh, are truly interdisciplinary and the uh, group, uh, this cultural one, main goal would be to cultivate, maintain or promote Polish culture and heritage amongst Poles and or Irish communities. And the Best examples uh, uh, are Polish Social and Cultural Association from Dublin, along with Irish Polish Society, and both of them were established in, in the last century, around uh, 79, 80s uh, uh, in Dublin. Uh, there are also the much younger organizations like MyCor, Gory PL, Midlary Dublin, or Midlands Polish Community uh, from Longford. And uh, the so, so some of those organizations are doing some extra bit of work apart from promoting cultural integration. They are active in their local community as well, as well doing some community work, uh, organizing integration festivals or funding some facilities uh, uh, in the local area. For example, Midlands Polish community organized and funded some, some, some uh, masks for hospitals and some, some cleaning facilities as well. So that was interesting one. Uh, then we have this educational kind of uh, 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 group, uh, which 
aim to maintain the Polish language heritage. Uh, as I was mentioning, there's about 52 uh, Polish, Polish Saturdays, Saturday complementary schools. Uh, and many of them are grouped uh, into uh, like umbrella organizations like Polish Irish sorry, Polish Education, Educational Society or KIP, Polish Educational Federation. Uh, there's also some individual associations and this Polish, for example, Irish Education Association was interesting example of even advo advocating for uh, uh, introducing the Polish language into the secondary uh, schools in Ireland uh, a few years ago. So they might be as well active on some kind of political level. Then uh, the third group uh, is uh, a one which, which, which aims to support uh, and address challenges faced by the uh, Polish people in Ireland. And a very good example is the Derazem Center from Cork who provides some translating services, who provides some mental health support, uh, have some psychologists, has some uh, advisory service. Another example would be uh, CKU from Dublin, who, who focus specifically on the providing some, some psychological uh, support for, for people in need, uh, which can't really access the English language services because of the lack of the English language skills. And uh, an extra, and I would believe important group of, of uh, the Polish organization is the, uh, is, is, uh, on the kind of the advocacy level, and that's Forum Polonia, who who is a again platform for for various different organizations, and Forum Polonia acts for interest of the Polish diaspora in Ireland and promoting and supporting its involvement in Irish society. We are reaching a different level, trying to to change some policies on the national and local level to to address the challenges faced by by Polish diaspora in Ireland. And there are also, and that, that's another interesting thing is that the, there are also two interesting festivals in Ireland run by Poles uh, aiming to promote Polish culture as Polish Art Festival Limerick. Uh, I think this year is would be, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, 15th, uh, 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 and if, if 15th such a festival in Limerick and Polska Era Festival, which is, amazing because it is the aim is to promote Polish culture amongst uh, Irish and Irish culture amongst Poles living in Ireland and to find some links between two cultures and this year is another version of the of the of the festival uh, to conclude this interview uh, this overview I think that the, the, the main biggest problem facing all these community organizations uh, is the limited funding and mainly uh, it is, this work is done through voluntary work. All those organizations have zero employees, uh, almost zero employees sometimes, lack necessary core funding to properly uh, to, to function properly. So the need of Polish community could be advocated or addressed by maybe other organization. Uh, but, but, so I've listed some other organization, but from, from our experience, uh, the focus of those organizations uh, is mainly placed on third country nationals, these migrants, from the third country might have more urgent needs and uh, are far more vulnerable than other EU citizens. Uh, but it may lead to a situation where majority of migrants' needs in Ireland are not properly addressed uh, or somehow represented. Uh, just kind of brief overview, uh, let's check in time, all right, uh, on the global Polish diaspora. So there's about uh, 20, sorry, sorry, 20, they have more than 20 million Poles living uh, 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 abroad from Poland. And the majority of them are, as you can see, in USA, uh, in Canada and Brazil, and many as well in Russia and in Argentina. And interesting enough, there's more and more links built, built between those diasporas right now because of the development of the internet. So we are creating some more links between each other. So when we think about possible cooperation between the Polish organizations in Ireland and different uh, stakeholders, uh, I just prepared maybe 
two, three examples of that. One will be the polit political engagement projects run by various Polish community organizations, including Forum Polonia. And one example is Vote World Home campaign. And we, 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 some of the initiatives were done with uh, Africa Center and Akidwa. Uh, uh, it was a very interesting project uh, in 2000, I believe, 16, uh, called Migrants for, for Ireland, uh, um, when a number of different migrant led organizations prepared a manifesto. So there is a spectrum, there is a field for further cooperation between different, different organizations. Uh, another interesting uh, initiatives which could be uh, uh, expanded is good, I, I call that good cause initiatives. And uh, a, a very good example of that would be bloody foreigners campaigns. It was, it was to promote amongst Irish the contribution made by Poles in Ireland. And uh, we focus as well on the uh, blood donors. So, 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 so Poles were giving the blood uh, to, 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 uh, to Irish hospitals. And it was very well received. And the idea was to expand that to other nationalities, just to show that the migrants are, are, are contributing not only by, by, by hard work, paying taxes, and enriching the society, but as well as contributing to the, by giving the blood to the hospitals. Uh, I was mentioning about the cultural projects, the Spolska Era Festival. It's a very interesting one because it's, the focus is not only on promoting the specific culture of, of specific country, but to finding the links between Ireland and, in that case, Poland, and promoting those links. And when, when we think about possible fields of cooperation, uh, uh, I would perhaps focus mainly uh, on the, maybe even the current uh, climate, on the discrimination and racism. I will talk about that a little bit uh, uh, in a minute, but also about the I mean, I'm sorry. I have to finish. <laughs> All right, so uh, just, just to, just to uh, make a final comment on that, Right now, there is ongoing uh, consultation on the National Action Plan Against Racism. And finally, uh, there is such a, such a uh, 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 opportunity for different groups to get together and discuss the importance of, of uh, 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 preparing the National Plan Against, against Racism. And consultation uh, is to be finished, I believe, in the beginning of or the middle of, of July because it's an important issue and uh, a number of different researchers and publications uh, brought to the, to the attention that uh, there is a need for such a plan. So, so that could be explored by, by all of the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barnaba. Uh, I'm sure we'll be able to return to the issues you raised in the end of your uh, very informative presentation during the discussion. And now I would like to give the floor to our second presenter, uh, Meb Bajabi, uh, who is an, uh, he, whose educational background sorry, is in rural development and management. He is originally from uh, Gambia, uh, and he is the executive director of uh, Africa Center, uh, and he has been involved, uh, his organization, in informing Ireland's uh, international development policies. And now I'm going to uh, share your presentation. Um, sorry, okay. Okay, so the floor is yours. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Galia and the Development Studies Association of Ireland for the invitation and um, um, I think it's, it's, it's a good timing to have this dialogue, especially uh, on development, which my presentation is going to be more focused on. Um, so, and I think for the, first of all, is the, like I'm, I'm sharing some pictures uh, in this presentation, which are Africa Center pictures. And uh, these pictures can on, cannot be used or reused for any promotion in any way without having an authorization from the Africa Center. So just to, to bear that in mind. Um, I think for like, there were, there were three questions that were sent uh, in terms of preparation for this. And I thought probably it would be good to, to, to actually cross check that with uh, some charities in Ireland, but also the African diaspora communities as well groups, which I actually did uh, 
speak to a few people. It's not a kind of a research project whereby I can push a percentage on it, but this is just a reflection on that. And then my presentation would also touch on few challenges as well, but also it will give forward to see where we can collaborate um, as well. So I think first of all, when we are talking about uh, factors that, um, that determine collaboration between Irish, Irish charities and diaspora organizations, especially the Africa and other organizations in Ireland that are membership organizations. First of all, we have to really look into the composition of these groups, what are, who are their members and who are they working with? So I divided this into the diaspora into two sections, the first generation of the diaspora. Um, these are people who actually moved to Ireland here and they would be interested in development, uh, they will be educated here. Some people will come through other processes as well in Ireland. Yeah, the next one. And then the second generation um, or subsequent generation of diaspora. It, in the case of Ireland, we only talk about the second generation of the diaspora because like uh, most people who are born here are in their twenties. There, there would be African diasporas who have been here long before most Africans came here. But just these two group of people would have a different need. And that actually inform how groups actually work with uh, my diaspora organization. And then I think the perception also uh, from the, 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 the charity sector of these organizations also contribute a lot. When you talk to the charity sectors about what they think of diaspora organizations, I think first thing that always uh, it comes to their mind is that they are mainly concerned about integration and inclusion, whereby they are trying for, for the diaspora to settle, to get jobs, regularization, get their papers done and things like that. And then in some cases also, I think people see diaspora organization more cultural participation. When there's an event there, they call you, you come and participate, uh, maybe singing, dancing, uh, drumming and all those things. So those are, those are some of the perceptions as well. And a, port of, a point of contact, Sometimes they want something from an, uh, a country or about a community, they, they, they call up on the organization and the specific contribution to their national or cultural person. We have seen these things in schools as well. Um, but like, and I think going forward to ask the diaspora, uh, what do they think about um, like charities in Ireland? There's always this, concept of misrepresentation in terms of fundraising, use of images and messages. But this is not only about the main Irish um, organizations. Uh, we have actually seen that some of the diaspora organizations are also using these images in terms of their own fundraising. So charities doesn't only stop at the main um, like aid agencies, but also diaspora NGOs can fall under that. So it's always difficult to get employment with the charity sector. Um, there was actually a, a publication, I, I think somebody did, and uh, Suzanne, actually, I read it. I, I actually came across the publication from your LinkedIn, which uh, was actually about how people found it very difficult to get into the charity sector by an Indian woman. I cannot actually remember fully, but it was a very good piece to look at that. But in fact, it's not only about the main charity organization. They will say the same thing about the Africa Center as well. It's very difficult to get jobs in, 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 in the sector. And people think that the charity sector is highly paid compared to what has actually happened. They will say the same thing to, to us in the Africa Center. Most African diaspora think that we are earning a lot of money. So these are, the, these are some of the things. And then uh, the money spent in, uh, is, is the money that is raised is spent in Ireland than overseas. The running cost is something that people always look into. Like charities running costs are higher than the actual money that goes um, to countries in terms of development. Yeah, another slide. So challenges like challenge, uh, challenging the public perception of international development and promote more inclusive society. So I think this is something that we need to actually look into as well. How can we actually work together to make sure that this thing happen? Um, diaspora organizations need support financially. I think it would be very good. Barnaba mentioned about the funding, uh, lack of funding, but there's a lot of ask for diaspora organizations, even to team up, to work on campaigns, and then even hear their voice 
had is very difficult because most of us are not actually working or oh, we are on a very tight budget so that's that's also something that affects us and then some diaspora organizations actually felt that the campaign should address inequalities on trade relations and a trade causing conflict tax avoidance by cooperation but also charities so we tend to see that most of the campaigns uh, i know that like some charities have dual mandate they campaign on issues in ireland but also is issues on overseas but like it is it's very difficult uh, to get diaspora organization engaged in campaigns when you only talk about outside ireland when people are struggling with things here and then we we, we think that like most diaspora organizers also think that like uh, charities don't go into campaigns like uh, arm trade like that are causing conflict because we think that most of these development are affected by that or in fact um people are not paying taxes where if they work as overseas like uh, expatriates that's changing but that's just something that i i think is is, is, is a challenge charities have dual mandates as i mentioned uh, in terms of campaign inequality like asylum system so most of the Irish charities are not involved in that as well. Homeless, less um, uh, employment, especially in this COVID situation is, is affecting a lot of the diaspora. And this informed the way organizations actually work. Another slide. So the role of diaspora organizers in realization of, in realization of inclusive development, both in countries of origin and in the Irish society, yeah. So I think in countries of origin, um, like diaspora organizations are doing a lot. That is not known in the public. We are involved in job creation, um, especially like for us at the Africa Center, what we are doing now in our Africa program, um, we are actually trying to see how remittance could be leveraged in terms of SME development. So we are working with the Central Bank of the Gambia to see that how remittance going to the Gambia can create job, uh, jobs for young people. Because like it's a country, 60% of the population are young people. And these are the people going through the Mediterranean Sea to reach Europe. But I think that's, that's very important. And then informing development policy. Uh, if you look at the picture on the right there, it's myself and someone from the Africa Center and the Vice President of the Gambia. So we actually go and talk to these policy makers at that high level to see that how development policy could change because they, they actually listen to us as well. We work with communities in terms of their own development, but also we campaign on advocacy. Uh, we, we do campaign and advocacy on migration and development because I think for us, um, if you see the picture, like that was a capacity development project we ran for government employees that are working in the grassroots to actually link migration to development, not only remittances, but how can you use remittance in SME development, but also getting diaspora to actually invest in businesses, creating jobs and things like that. So this is what uh, the, the, we do actually in countries of um, origin. The next slide. Yeah, and then in Ireland, uh, we include, L, we are involved in a lot of uh, integration and inclusion. Banawa mentioned this thing, and I think like the ourselves, we did that and then informing development policy. The first picture below is ourselves when we actually asked Iris A to come to us to in, in the development, the new development policy. We actually had a special session whereby we brought the African diaspora leaders to actually look into that. And then also we do a lot of advocacy and campaign when you when we, we talk to politicians. So these are some of the things that actually we we do in terms of um what we contribute to countries of origin and countries uh, that uh, in, in Ireland here. The next slide. So the challenges that prevent, prevent diaspora organizers to engage in closer cooperation with Irish or other diaspora-led organizations uh, and with stakeholders, diasporas are actually underfunded. So it actually impacts a lot on, on our work. Uh, different in agenda between diaspora organizers and the mainstream organizations because sometimes we are actually fighting for issues on residency, discrimination, racism, and things. And then most, in most cases, like uh, mainstream organizations are not interested in these areas. The next thing, and then duplication of activities, especially among diaspora organizations. So it's not only about the main uh, organizations here, but within diaspora organizations as well, there's a lot of duplications. And it's make, 
that's for organizers and very difficult to work together as well. Not only that, but recently, even in Ireland, we realized that people come to the Africa Center to say that let's form another organization. And when you look into it, they are actually doing the same things, the aims and vision of that organization, like to compete with you. So how can you actually work together? So this, these are a kind of repetition. It's not only about the main organizer, but even within the diaspora organizations, it's a big challenge as well. Next slide. An opportunity that some organizations have in common initiative to impact life and vulnerable communities and individuals in the global south and in Ireland, especially in the current climate. And I think that in our uh, countries of origin, we have an opportunity that because we understand the culture and the language. And I think this is what people need to actually look into. We know how the system works because we are there. Like I was in the Gambia last year for six months when the coronavirus uh, hit. Most of the, the, the expatriates actually left. And in fact, people were even saying to me that should I be evacuated or things like that. But I just stayed on because we had an activity to do. So this is something that we have to look into. And we have contacts. Diaspora has contacts. Like I, I can actually bring somebody in, 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 in another place at a higher level on WhatsApp today that we have. And also trust is something that I think it could be, it could be something that people can uh, really work with us because they trust us, we are part of the system. In Ireland, diaspora knows their communities, uh, what they go through, because like some of it, we live in it. Most of us have been in the asylum process. Most of us have, uh, we are subject to racism every day. And then we are losing our jobs, losing houses, accommodation and things like that. So these are from our personal experience. Most of us are highly educated as well. If you look at what people are writing in terms of not getting jobs, even in development sector, most of these people have degrees, they have masters, highly educated, but it's always something. And I think we are multilingual as well. This is something that I think should be an opportunity for people to work together because we can speak a lot of languages as well. Next slide. So conclusion and way forward, I think we need to start looking at joint activities between diaspora organizations and charities which are more thematic and country specific. So like, especially ourselves, we would love to see, we are actually in Gambia at the moment with our West Africa a program, but we are going to Zambia and then we have a program we are developing with Ghana as well. So we are looking into how we can collaborate with people. Employment for diaspora members, especially in country programs. And this is something that I think uh, organizations can look into as well, because there's a lot of diaspora here who would be willing to go and work in, in the countries of origin. The next one, partnership on research projects, especially with other partners. I think we need to really look into this, especially with the Development Studies Association itself. There's a, there's a wide range of opportunities um, that we can work together in terms of research reports. And uh, also diaspora organizations would love to see people on their boards or advisory committees to inform the work that they are doing. The next slide. And then explore opportunities of a merger. This picture here on the right hand side is that it's not actually the first time Africa Center and Africa Refugee Network merged around 2004. So we might as, as well think about mergers in the future as well because of we are struggling in terms of economic situation. So these are some of the things that I think we can actually look into uh, as well. Anyway, thanks very much. It's just a limited time, but I think it's, it's good to have this conversation. Hopefully, we'll have more in looking at other areas as well. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before we move on, I hope uh, you don't mind all of us to take this short poll. If you could uh, just select the organization, the sector that you represent. Okay, half. We are almost there. A lot of NGOs here. <laughs> okay, five more people to vote. I'm afraid I missed what you, you asked us to do there because I was interrupted. Could you repeat that? Yes, yes. Could you please select the type of sector that you represent? Do you represent the academia, governmental sector, NGO, diaspora organization? In the chat, in the chat, is it? Yeah, there is a poll. There is a poll open. There's a poll. Okay. It's active right now, yes. 
uh, and we're looking forward to four more people to if they're I mean next to the computer or however they have joined us uh, yeah three more people uh, I'll just give half a minute more uh, but well we have uh, like uh, about 70 percent angels um, 20 percent on diaspora organizations 47 other NGOs uh, so uh, I will assume that whoever is right now in front of the computer have uh, voted. Uh, and um, okay, so uh, 20 out of 22. Uh, so 65% I'll just repeat. Or I don't know if you can see this. Uh, no, you don't see, only I can see it. Okay, so I'll just end the polling and I assume you're going to see it. Yeah, uh, okay, share results. Uh, do you see now the results, everybody? Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, excellent. Uh, so uh, now it is time for our third speaker, Suzanne Keating, who is, of course, Doha's uh, CEO. Uh, she has extensive experience working in a number of countries in the global south as well, and she has also uh, been affiliated with the United Nations. Her background is in history and African politics, and Susan, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Galleon, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, yes, I like what you said. My experience was in history. It seemed a very, very long time ago um, that I was studying, um, alas. But I'm delighted to be here, and, and thanks to the following, uh, the, the last two presenters, always really, really interesting. It, it's not something um, in terms of connection with the diaspora community that, that I know enough about, which of course is why we're here today. And again, thanks to Galia for organizing this. Um, I don't have a slide, I'm afraid. It's probably um, why I'm so um, out of academia, but I'm just going to talk to three points. Um, first, just to, just to get a sense of, you know, this, this idea of, you know, the, the importance and the urgency behind collaboration, particularly around how we can improve development to the global south and this question around Kind of advocacy around racism um, and integration in Ireland. I do then just want to touch on um, the here and now, the great COVID moment, um, because I do think it's an opportunity for us, um, but I'd be interested to hear what your reflections are um, and if this, this does dictate um, some urgency um, around this topic. And lastly, I may be going to put a proposal to you in terms of what I think um, are some possible opportunities for greater collaboration. But first up, so, I mean, I think I was asked in this, what factors determine the importance and urgency of collaboration on development work with the Global South and on advocacy against racism? And I think as already has been pointed out, I think <laughs> the issue here is that we're coming from very, very different starting points. And in fact, our agendas are very different. <laughs> And here, look, I am representing international NGOs. I don't speak uh, on behalf of any individual NGO. It is my, my personal view. But when I look at the DOCUS network itself, even there, there's so many different agendas. And people are looking at it in so many different ways. Um, and what I would say is that the main focus of international NGOs is development work on the global south. And in fact, there's been very, very little connection on this broader issue around racism, advocacy around racism uh, and integration in Ireland. OK, um, that's not a criticism. That's just a reality. Um, I think we've got Action Aid. I know, Caroline, um, you're on the line. I think Action Aid is one of the very, very few agencies that have tried to bridge the divide through their FGM work looking at the relationship and their, their programming overseas and back in Ireland, but you're quite unique in that way. And I'll admit I've been slightly staggered, dare I suggest, I've been challenging quite a lot that, for example, on migration and refugees, most of our members say we're just focusing on refugee issues, IDP issues in the global south, okay? What, and what happens when they get here, things like asylum, whatever, that's somebody else's job okay so there hasn't really been a sense that that's that part of our role so very very different starting points and it is worth saying that's not a criticism of international NGOs it is just the reality and if you look back to where many have come from there's so much diversity there 
um, you know, the, the groups that I work with, you know, a lot of them are coming from a faith based background. Uh, some are coming from very much a humanitarian service delivery type background. Um, and to be honest with you, over the last 10 years, because of donor pressures, um, what we're all being told about is we've got to focus, focus, focus. We can't do everything. We can't be everywhere. And that's tended to mean we've actually been narrowing um, our agendas rather than looking at that broader collaborative piece. Um, and lastly, I would say, again, I, I think it's already been mentioned, it's been very, very tough times for fundraising. OK, um, and where we spend our funds, how we spend our funds, there's huge pressure there. And more and more, we're being asked to spend the funds in the global south, in the countries that matter. So the opportunity to do advocacy in Ireland, to connect with domestic programmes has, has been quite limited. I would have liked to have said that in 2015, when the Sustainable Development Goals uh, was negotiated and agreed, this was and should be a huge opportunity for collaboration amongst our different groups. After all, you know, the SDGs at the, at the heart of it, it not only helped us to see the connections between domestic and international, it also demanded partnerships beyond what we've ever seen before. But I will have to confess, as much as I love the SDGs, I think what has failed so far is to even imagine what I would say an ecosystem that helped us understand how we all connect with each other to deliver on them. I would also say now, I've only got 10 years to go when I've looked at it from where I'm sitting and from what's happening in Ireland on the SDGs, there's a massive lack of funding behind them. We know that the trillions to the billions never materialized. I would also question the political will, both at the global level, but in particular in Ireland right now. And I think you also see that there's a real lack of trust between the different partners. A very good example here, some of you might have been to what we call the stakeholder forums. This was initiated by the government, by the department. Whenever I've gone to those stakeholder forums, they've been very unparticipatory. I don't believe anyone was listening. Everybody was there to say, what can we get out of this? And we we're almost talking at each other. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But there wasn't a dialogue. And there certainly wasn't a dialogue around the areas of tension and inconsistency like tax justice, like climate. We were all talking past each other. Again, that's not a criticism, but that's because there was no real thinking, or I would say on behalf of the government, and not enough political will uh, or determination around delivering on the goals. But what now? We have a COVID moment. Enough about worrying about the past, what can we do now? And here, particularly because of the last 15 months or so, in ways. First of all, in our sector for international NGOs, and um, COVID in general, what we say, it hasn't created anything new, but my goodness, has it accelerated some of the key tensions within uh, the network, within international NGOs. In particular, just the very practical reality that we've had to go to remote working, it's accelerated this conversation around locally led development. And in my view, not a moment too soon. It has also, let's remember last year with the Black Lives Matter, um, there's been lots of top conversation around decolonization, around inequality. And within our community then, it has really opened up debate and question around our own diversity and our own inclusion. Hence, uh, as you noted, our blog uh, that we put out the other day, are we internally ready? And I think even before Black Lives Matter, our sector was really questioning itself as allegations around safeguarding, et cetera, came up. It was talking about inequality and lack of power. So that's really come to the fore now and it is testing um, international NGOs. And the third thing I would say around this COVID moment, it is really making us think about how we're engaging with the Irish public. 
Okay, we've been working a lot on this eth ethical communications code of conduct on images, but I think it's really come to the fore now. Okay, that's partly the opportunity under COVID is that suddenly charities and international NGOs are now seen as valuable. We're the frontline workers, whereas before we were often dismissed um, by government, I think. Um, we're also kind of on the, on the more negative side, though, uh, in terms of when you look at the media, when you look at social media, we're seeing more kind of aggressive, perhaps far right movement, uh, a, a much more kind of internal kind of debate. Don't really want to go um, beyond uh, Ireland a little bit. Uh, very, very little coverage of the, you know, the world outside of Ireland as we all try and manage COVID. So that has been um, a challenge. It's worth saying on the public awareness front, if anyone doesn't know, DOCUS has been working um, over the last few years on what we're calling the Worldview Project. And this is a survey and analysis to really understand what the perceptions are towards international development. Okay. We did a survey recently and just I just pulled out a couple of things for this for today that you might be interested in. Um, it said that 68% felt that a multicultural island was a very, very positive thing. That's what they wanted us to work towards. But 89% felt that there was real racial discrimination in Ireland, 89%. Our survey also talked that 57% were concerned with issues around minority rights, asylum seekers, all that LGBT, that kind of thing but only 20% were involved in it. So it gives you an idea just how much work we've got to do if we're to engage with the public on these issues, whether it's global development uh, or indeed on racism. I'd also like to say this COVID moment for all the opportunity, I would say the window is very, very limited. The gray clouds, dare I say, the black clouds are gathering as the economy opens up, but we see the massive hit to the economy. Our members are extremely concerned about what funding looks like over the next few years. And already, like we saw in austerity, when, when the threat is there, we tend to compete rather than collaborate. So I would say we've got to grab this window now because it's not going to be with us for long. Very briefly then on to my third point and more, what is the opportunity out there? And I know my colleagues have given some really good practical advice. I'm, I'm gonna go out there and say, well, actually what we've been focusing on right now is we need a better, bolder, more positive vision, okay? We've been doing some work around reimagine international NGOs by 2030. And you know what it looks like to me, what I would love to aspire to our sector, it wouldn't even be a sector at all. When we did this workshop, our members were saying, we want to move beyond being considered a sector international NGOs to being part of the civil society movement. A movement that has at its heart this principle around global solidarity. It's not us and them. It's not diaspora versus Irish versus global South. We're actually, a global community. And part of that is redefining a civil society that is political, that is willing to advocate on behalf of each other. And what that vision also looks like for me in order to do that, international NGOs have to change. We have to move from how we currently define ourselves as intermediaries to being, as I say, much more political, more of that kind of advocacy piece, but also much more partnership led um, with the global South. I would also say to achieve my vision by 2030, our funding models have to dramatically shift. I think our speakers have already talked about limited resources. It's not just about limited resources, it's where we get those funds from. And our system is more one that demands that we compete against each other than collaborate. OK, it's also one that I would believe uh, disincentivizes. It creates a culture of scarcity rather uh, than one of plenty. And how can we use the resources that we have um, better? Very practically, though, how do we get there to my, to my vision, if you like? Um, 
collaboration is very much for me at the heart of it. But three things, we need more collaboration, but that will only happen if we are each willing to let power go. Each of us have to cede some power. We have to stop thinking we're right, we've got the answers, and you are wrong. And let's face it, there's even a little bit of that even today. Like, we know the answer in Africa, we know the whatever. We have to be willing to let go of power. And we also have to collaborate, but as I say, we've got a challenge um, around funding modalities. Um, and lastly, we have to do more collaboration, but in a way that promotes a shared understanding of the importance of governance and accountability. Okay, and when I talk about accountability, um, I talk about accountability to donors, to partners and to the Irish taxpayer. Uh, I was on a session yesterday with an amazing Indian activist and she said at the end, as we, as we had reimagined our world again, she said, the biggest problem at the moment is that the distance between the taxpayer and the, and the, and the community in the global south is so wide and yet those two groups have most in common. Our role, whether it's diaspora groups, NGOs, civil society movements, is to try and bring those two groups together. And at the heart of that, understanding that common purpose, which is around the dignity of us all and global solidarity. Um, we've also got to imagine though, as, as all of us in, in between us intermediaries, Let's remember that um, we are part of the problem and in making ourselves aware of that, we can become part of the solution. But change has to start individually. Um, and that again is why change is so difficult, but I believe it has to happen. That's it from me. I hope some of that makes sense. Um, so over to you, thanks Kigali. Thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, and now I'm giving the floor to our uh, reporter, Dr. Caroline Mooney, uh, who has studied international peace studies in Kenya, Uganda, and Ireland. She is a gender peace and development specialist, and she is affiliated to a, a diaspora organization, Akidwa, and to an Irish NGO, Action Island. Caroline, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Garia, and uh, thank you everyone, uh, the presenters and uh, the participants for being here this afternoon. And uh, I am really honored to be a rapporteur uh, this afternoon. And uh, so without much ado, um, we'll look at um, what um, like what others have said. I'll try to integrate that and I'll try to take not as much time as possible, as well as give my own perspective, uh, just like um, Susan has said. And Susan, we keep on meeting and uh, that's a great thing. And so, uh, like you've heard, I have a development background and uh, then gender and uh, development all those things and uh, um, I also have uh, like 20 percent one of um, I, I have that uh, uh, my, my foot is stuck in academia like 20 percent so like I cross um, sometimes I can be all over doing this doing that and uh, with, uh, with, with with a lot of uh, I, sometimes I can wear a lot of hats and other times I, I try to reduce them so that I can be able to focus um, so I'm looking at uh, when I was preparing, when I was thinking about what to say today, I was thinking like some of the things Suzanne has said, I was also thinking about them in a in thinking about them. And uh, I was thinking about the word demand driven. When I used to work in Kenya, and that's a good while ago, we had the word demand driven and the other word was supply driven. As we look at even the, before it was NDGs and now we are at SDGs, how much, how much of what we are doing is demand driven because when there is demand when people know because we know we know that a lot of people in this world today even the people we may call the poorest of the poor they know what they want but do we take that deliberate effort to ask them like to carry out uh, maybe uh, what we like calling a needs assessment and that's actually that actually does not even take long to carry out a thorough needs assessment to ask like, what are your needs? And then they say, and how would you like that met? And then when, when things are done like that, I can tell you, actually it will end up not being very costly 
because because it's something the need which is being met it is something which is felt on the ground it means that they will also meet the person or the people or the groups which are trying to help them they'll be able to, they'll be able to meet them halfway because it's what you call um a felt need and so we also need to think about that a lot like the kind of needs which are being met how are they demand driven or supply driven is because someone has said that i have got this so much money i've got this pot of money and i want maybe to help to, to help these people and for with that or that or, or, or the other so we need to look also at that like how do we identify needs and uh and and how much are the people who we say they are being helped and although i also, I also have uh, an issue with that word helping um how much they have participated and what i also find again sometimes a bit problematic is when we bring other words like participatory development yet we know that the people who are being targeted on the ground they have not participated in identified even speaking about their own needs and when things are done like that we know that participation is very very low and um, you end up even forcing people to participate in their own development which should not which should not be the case and um, and 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 so and and so now and, and so now I also want to just to say something very very small about like the lived experiences. So before I go to the lived experiences, I want to just touch on on COVID. That because of COVID, we said that uh, Susan mentioned that uh, this as like what 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 I like saying is that like what was going wrong before COVID, COVID has amplified that. And we've seen, we've seen that even as an organization here in Akidwa, that our our, our 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 constituents, what they were going through, we know that as some of the needs we deal with and some of the groups we deal with, they are at the bottom of the heap. But when COVID hit, their needs like multiplied because of other challenges which we're already going through. So because of COVID, I think we it's likely that as we come out of the as we come out of it, as 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 the world starts opening up, we need to hit the, res the reset button and go back again and start planning again from scratch. But we will not get anywhere if we are going to plan with the old mentality. We will find ourselves again with the same problems. Let's involve the people. Let us not plan for the people without involving them. Let us ask the people, like I had like the way Barnabas spoke and also Mbemba, let us involve the people, if it's Forum Poronia, if it is Africa Center and other groups, let's ask the people, what are their needs? And I'm sure you have people here like Mbemba, uh, Barnabas and others who are not presented in this, in, in, in this space this afternoon. Who can go and ask the people what are your needs and and then and and then again they are, they are, they are, and and then so that the money or the finances which is there as we work on on on, on new funding models models that it will meet the felt needs of the people and so let us not be armchair managers planning for people without involving them we will not get in where people are here they know what they need but we need to involve them we need to involve them and uh, so that we can also it's so, so that I, and that's what now as I'm, as I'm saying this is because as we emerge out of covid our our our, our, our focus will be more on demand and involvement and participation so that we do not end up speaking about people participating in their we do not end up speaking about particip participatory development yet participation is in our heads it's not in the in the other people's and i'm sure when participation in our heads when you go to write reports we say that it was it was this participation da, 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 and then you wonder where well, at what point did the people who are being targeted at what point did they get involved or or, or, or participate they're supposed to participate from the identification of the need. That is where participation needs to start. Not, 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 not just, not, 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 just um, uh, to, to, uh, no, 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 not just involving them at, um, at, 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 at the level of bringing them together for meetings, taking pictures and other things. That is not true participation. And um, then we, I want to say something about, uh, because sometimes we also like talking about like, oh, someone, when I look at, at, at that, that 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 um the way our our two speakers who spoke before the way they they, they, they said very very nice things and um one of the thing which i think was was coming across about the need like for change so that people can be more can move from a to b but and susanna has also said that uh change is difficult and it is true change is very 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 difficult it's one of the most difficult things and it's and it's how i know i personally i am in the business of change uh change um behavior change especially 
but I'm conscious, I'm very, very conscious of the fact that change is one of the most difficult things. And why is this difficult? Because for someone to change from this, to, because it means that you have to leave something and you have to move to, to move to another. What I have noticed with most of us development organizations, and uh, Susan mentioned that I was in action aid working on, um, on, um, on FGM, is that, and it, which, which involved like looking at behave, certain behaviors and attitudes and digging into them so that people can swap this behavior for that. Change exposes us to a lot of vulnerability because it means that we have to go deep inside ourselves. And sometimes as we struggle, as we struggle, because sometimes there can't there can be a struggle. And that is why there's need as we work towards behavior change, even for people who are working in that and also who are being changed. Anybody, and this is something I've said a lot, anybody who is in this business and thinks that they do not, and when they look, when they look at their own personal journeys, they think that. Mm, Caroline, there's nothing I need to change about myself, but they need to change. Seriously, if that is how you look at it, even from you, 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 seriously, you will not get far in this. Because we tend also to learn a lot, to reflect a lot as we work with people. And again, out of that, let's go back to the, to the, to the vulnerability we have talked about, that it makes us vulnerable as you observe, as you reflect, as you see what you're telling people, as you facilitate what they are telling you. And it takes us to another space of thinking. And then you also, like, also start, start questioning your own things. And then also start also, and that process can be difficult and it needs to be supported. But what I find problematic sometimes is when we have these funding models, these funding models, which are working towards behavior change. And then they are saying that we expect this behavior maybe to be changed within maybe 24 months. Seriously, seriously. Even the person who is applying for that funding, even putting those nice ideas, the ideas by which are very Googleable these days, like you can Google anything and then you're able to put that into nice words and come up with nice initials and you have a big word. You know that two years to change a behavior which someone picked from the, when they were born and they are still, it's still forming or it's still there now it's too ingrained. It's such a short time. And again, an idea, even look at what you call them behavior change well. When you look at even how those ideas come about, how that behavior is formed, the first person, a person, a human being is socialized, and then at maybe at that at the end of that period, maybe to show the person who gave the money that this person, this group has changed, and that they have to come there and say these words. We need maybe to find other ways. We need maybe to come up with other innovative ways and names of calling or, or, or of what we are going to call uh, those outcomes, but not to say that uh, people are going to change maybe within one month, two months, three months, 10 months, because we've said that change takes us to a space which, which, which exposes our vulnerabilities. And it's a very, very scary place to be in. And sometimes it can also be very, very difficult. And so even to measure it, you also need to come with other ways of measuring even that change itself so that uh, we can uh, we can be able to move together and we both have said that uh, anybody any one of us who thinks that they have nothing to do that they have no business in change their own personal journeys are so perfect they don't need to change anything they are thinking or anything that seriously this this business is not for you and um, then also about I was also thinking about last night I was thinking about uh uh, like power and what power does. And uh, then it occurred to me, and this is something I also, I, I also uh, picked uh, another place and another place and another place because I go picking a lot. And uh, power is something I, I like thinking about a lot. And uh, everyone, everyone in this life has power. Even those people we are trying to say that maybe they are based there or based there. We all, everybody has power. But sorry, the problem uh, is sorry, can we also give a chance to to the yeah to the other participants okay. to yeah okay okay yeah. if you but, could wrap up, well, thank you. Okay, so as, as I wrap up, so the thing is, um, power. How much are we willing to recognize the other the other person's power? 
so that it, it, they can also shine. For, for me, that is something we need to do to recognize. You actually, don't, you don't need even to, to let go any power, no. I think what you need to do is just to recognize another person's power and give them, give him all her, give that person, all those people, that space to, to shine. And I think that's all. And uh, thank you, Garia and everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the solutions you provided are truly universal uh, and therefore, well, they, they seem doable. <laughs> Uh, I would like to give the opportunity now to uh, all the participants of this webinar to uh, ask a question to the panelists or uh, share their own view. So you can just unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask a question. Uh, is there a person who is already willing to uh, join the discussion? Galia, I might kick off. Hi, hello, Mark. Hello, everybody. I know some friendly faces here. I'm Moira Layden. I'm with the Assistant General Secretary with the Association of Secondary School Teachers. But I'm really here in, I suppose, different capacity today in the sense of um, being involved with various networks around SDG4 and global education. Uh, I think um, I was particularly motivated to attend this seminar because I think the issue you're addressing is absolutely critical. And I think, uh, um, Galia, that today's event is really just the beginning of a much, uh, of a very necessary conversation. Uh, I mean, to me, we're talking about concepts of citizenship and the diaspora. I mean, when, when do we transcend being a, a migrant to being a full citizen and all of that? All of those really uh, probing questions, which, as Carolina says, are to do with power. And representation, etc. So, I, I really think this is uh, and uh, Suzanne uh, from Docus there. Her contributions I thought were particularly insightful. So we all need to do a lot of thinking. Um, but what struck me, uh, I'm just to tell a personal story. I'm um, the chairperson of the Mead branch of the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign, and we've had a number of public uh, vigils, stalls, demos over the last month. And what is actually really, uh, and I, this is trying to get my head around getting some concepts into my head, what is so striking about these events um, in public spaces is the amount of, um, I, I don't like using this word, but I'll use it for clarity, the amount of foreign nationals who are present. I would say 60% of our participants are foreign nationals, not exclusively from uh, Arabic or Middle Eastern countries, which would have a natural affinity, obviously, with the uh, Palestinian people, but globally. And uh, I just thought, oh my God, I mean, there's this huge dimension of civil society out there. And they were saying, oh, they're delighted to be involved. This is great. Can we come again? This sense of wanting to be part of the political discourse of the, the, the country, but also to have agency, to be able to think that you have agency uh, around an issue as uh, uh, burning and as political as Palestine. So really, it's just observations, but I just feel I, I would like to read maybe, um, and I'm very interested by all the contributors. I think each of you have given very in interesting insights, but maybe Galia in the um, in the DSAI working group, you might maybe circulate some um, theoretical or conceptual papers around this concept of what we're trying to articulate, because I do feel that's what I'm doing anyway. I'm trying to articulate, but I don't feel I'm getting at the core concepts. But well done. It's it's such an interesting um, discussion and I look forward to being, being part of others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moira. Um, any other feedback, questions? Um, or, uh, I mean, participants perhaps among yourselves? Um, I just maybe one, one thing to, to respond to that. And thanks for that, that Moira. I think, yeah, you, you said it very clearly. Look, this is ultimately about, about citizenship, but more that, that question of identity and how it's changing so much. And we've moved so far from this idea of having a single identity. You know, you're either Irish or you're not. Um, you know, that, that kind of thing. And we've really moved on for that, but, but sometimes our, our systems and processes haven't moved on um, as fast as, as society or our culture is. Um, it, it's worth saying as well, I, I want to say this before, I suppose I was interested in, in those figures around the, the what do we call them, non-Irish, Irish. Um, yeah, and our, our survey also similar sense, we had about 12.7% non-Irish from our survey. 
But what's equally important is actually when you look down at that diaspora, um, there's some very young, creative, dynamic, activist communities out there. And that really um, relates to what you said, Moira. So this is really, really exciting. You know, it's an exciting moment. I don't know if you've been following as well over the last few months of the horrible lockdown. You know, you've seen this kind of young Nigerian group using digital, using social media in an incredibly creative way. And every time I saw that stuff, I thought, God, I've got, I'm so old fashioned. I've got to move with the program quickly. Um, so again, uh, probably one thing I, I, I didn't include in my, my reimagined sector is that it's a much more digitally savvy sector um, and hopefully a much more creative and cultural one. Um, it's not just about partners in terms of different groups. It's about we need to use our arts and culture and that wonderful diversity and fusion around that um, to, to energize these conversations. Yeah, thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, well, I, I'll just perhaps briefly respond now to Moira as well. Uh, well, obviously, I'm interested in the issue, and that's why I thought about this uh, webinar. But uh, also, as I was uh, made aware uh, by some uh, Chinese scholars, I don't know where we're discussing because I'm not Polish myself, but I've been living all these years in Poland, and they said, "Ah, you're a migrant," and I said, "What? Me, migrant? You know, I, I never thought about myself in terms of being a migrant." And that like changed their perspective, my perspective, because okay, they view me as a migrant, then perhaps I'm a migrant. And what does this mean for me? And uh, well, I'm, I'm functioning, I'm working in the Polish Academy of Sciences. So what does it matter if I'm a migrant or not? But uh, then uh, if the uh, uh, if some other people perceive me so, then uh, I guess uh, that has some uh, implications. Uh, and I think that very much also relates to to what we talked about this uh, Irish non-Irish and uh, also as a person who has lived uh, recently in Ireland for three years I have also witnessed this uh, and uh, well um, I love it I think this is the strength uh, of this country uh, and basically uh, although there are challenges which our presenters have presented uh, have highlighted here there are so many uh, opportunities to be uh, worked on uh, and um, yeah I, I also hope this is just the beginning of a conversation uh, that would continue in one form uh, or um, another. Um, perhaps uh, some of other of the attendants want to join with providing um, feedback, opinion. Um, Dalia, if yeah. if I can say something to Moira, I, I think uh, Moira having those um, diaspora, like I tend to use more diaspora than migrants because diaspora encompasses migrants, people who are settled on documents and everything. But I think like having a large number of people from the diaspora background into those gatherings, actually for some, it reminds them of where they actually come from like the inequalities they have been subject to or things that they are actually going through. So they might be sympathetic to that and see that, okay, the organization they are attending or the event is also on something that they can contribute as global citizens. So that's where people go as well. And then for Suzanne, the, the, the reason why I started my presentation of diaspora organizations like ourselves, because the needs are totally different. The younger generations that are actually coming to the Africa Center, these techies, people who are interested in businesses like uh, high-end social media and stuff like that. So for that being the case, it's actually looking into how do you work with those people alongside the people who actually send remittances, they want to build businesses, they are supporting their families and stuff like that. So, and, and I think that's, that's, the, that's the way we have to look into. And I, and I, I suppose, Caroline, like I, I think uh, ourselves as membership organizers, either the Africa Center or uh, Forum Polonia, we wouldn't have any activities without having a consultation with our members, because I think that's a very bad development precedent um, to set up something that you wouldn't actually um, do an examination or maybe ask your people to actually work on activities. And I suppose that's, that's actually the, the fundamental of, of any organization. If people are not doing that, then I don't see why you are actually in development, because you are not there for your own self, you are there to actually support what is needed by your constituents. So that's how actually I, I believe we, we work through as well. 
Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I don't, perhaps Bernardo would like to take the floor. I cut you short at the end of your presentation, and now we have the freedom to discuss it in more detail. Or perhaps you could share. Actually, I've been always very curious about uh, your professional work uh, uh, in uh, in the union, Sipto. Uh, so. Um, you know, I, I I wanted to just touch what what uh, Member was saying about uh, uh, migrants or uh, people who are living in Ireland and uh, came to Ireland some time ago and they know uh, in and out about society and then they can maybe be somehow an uh, ambassadors in different country trying to bring the awareness of the Irish culture and what this country is about, as in his examples. When he was going to Ghana. What I'm thinking of is that uh, that there is a huge potential, in my opinion, uh, with so many very well qualified migrants who are really established in Ireland to be on various different state boards and being employed by the public sector. So they are more and more visible. They are not, and this is from my experience as a trade unionist as well, to see that I very rarely see migrants' faces on, on, uh, in some high offices or in some very like, you know, managerial uh, uh, roles. Um, one good example would be, for example, that we don't see migrant faces in television or radio. Uh, it would be great to see such faces because then the society will say, yeah, they are part of our society. And they can they can hold some responsible position, being an anchors in the in some TV programs. Uh, there were some efforts made by the various different migrant-led organizations to half uh, a, a, a migrant uh, a, a senator in Chennai. I think recently, recently about I think two years ago, there was an attempt to to have I think Salome Salome Mgua elected to the to the Senate. But there's a lot of to be done. In, within the Irish society to, to promote and uh, provide opportunities for migrants to, um, to be more active in, in semi-states or even though in charities as well, uh, 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 these this organizations. Um, in, terms of my, in terms of my presentation, I was, I was, I was a little bit cut. I, I thought that I would, be, I would manage to, to squeeze my presentation within the time, hopefully not. But what I was about to say is that uh, right now, there is a very good discussion among many stakeholders about uh, the uh, uh, National Action Plan Against Racism. Um, I know that, the, that, that, that in 2019, uh, Ireland was providing responses to the to the uh, uh, UN about uh, tackling racism and xenophobia, and there was a, a number of critical reports about what has been done uh, uh, in terms of addressing this xenophobia and 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 uh, uh, racism. And I think Suzanne was saying a very important thing that that uh, right now in we are. In In this momentum when we have an opportunity to maybe deal with some issues uh, uh, in, in relation to discrimination and racism. Back in 2008, there was a, there was a number of institutions like NCCRI or uh, Equality uh, Authority, and they were dismantled because of the crisis. And since 2008, there was no action plan against racism uh, designed or, or, or developed. And right now, we might be facing uh, another economic crisis because of the COVID. At the same time, there is some uh, public consultation on the this action plan. So that's an opportunity for, for us to sit down and, and get involved in that process, as well as there is some uh, discussion about the hate, hate speech and hate crime legislation. So that's another opportunity. And I hope we can, we can, we can use that somehow and, and join our forces to, 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 have it, to have it done right. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, anybody want? Sorry, Julia, could, I, could I just come in again just to add to what uh, Barnaba has said there? Um, of course, the, the other uh, aspect of the conversation we haven't had time to touch on, or unfortunately I'm going to have to leave myself now, is the whole thing of the, the rise of the far right and populism. 
it's probably important to communicate to, to people around the table that uh, a high level working group has been set up within the executive council of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions uh, involving uh, the general secretary, the president, and as they say, high guys, uh, um, uh, to look at uh, how the union movement, how it's 700,000 plus members can uh, be, how, how we respond strategically as, as unions and as members and as citizens to the threat of the far right. Because of course the far right has two pillars, racism and misogyny. And quite frequently they go hand in hand. So I think it's really important that you're aware of that, that this is the kind of, the, 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 I suppose the level of gravity with which uh, um, uh, populism and racism is seen at within the union movement. Uh, and it's a work in progress. But uh, Barnaba is absolutely correct. I mean, the union movement itself needs to be have more visibility around the workers it represents, etc. So, um, yeah, ju just to share that, that it's 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 an important piece of work. And uh, when it's where it's still in the process of being, what's the word, uh, um, going through the executive council, but when it when it will be finalised, it will be quite a, a serious political statement. So I, I'll send it to you, Galia, and you can you can share it with the DSAI um, people. Thank you. Um, um, as I see, we we still have a couple of minutes, and I thought of sharing with you. I have this uh, habit. It's an intellectual exercise, I would say. Uh, I have this habit of gaslighting myself. I would say, namely, uh, I'm all for engaging diaspora in development efforts, uh, but then. As a matter of self gaslighting, I asked myself, is there, a, is there a downside in engaging diaspora in development and in domestic affairs? Um, and uh, well, then asking this uh, um, perhaps absurd question, uh, I was thinking, OK, I've been living outside of uh, my native country for more than 20 years now. Uh, I consider myself an expert, obviously, because I'm a native, but when I go back there, do I always understand everything? Am I sure? <laughs> of course, well, on the one hand, being detached, I believe I can see more than people who live there. But on the other hand, I wouldn't vouch for 100% that I really understand what it is to be there because I'm no longer there. Uh, so if you wish to relate to that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I just say you. I think you raise a really, yeah, an, an important important point. But I think it's you know across the board, it's this question around you know our role as gatekeepers, um, and and you know in a way, I'd, I'd like to think we've got to move away from that. Um, and and this is where I say kind of participation. I think Caroline, you mentioned it, but we've got to rethink what what that means. It's it's about representing all our different views, but being open <laughs> to others. Um, and I think what what I've been interested in, in in the work that we've done recently, yes, it was very participatory, but we went so hard to find different people, and it wasn't about different groups, but it's just to have an open conversation so that we can break out from being gatekeepers and from our bubbles. I think we've got to be really careful of that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and then I would like also to now give the floor briefly to the other participants before we, to the, uh, to the other speakers, before we wrap up, we have five more minutes. I don't know, Caroline, maybe you want to uh, say a few final words? Yeah. Thank you very much, Garia. Uh, my, my few final words, um, not many, there are very few actually, like thank you for having me here and thank you everyone for coming. And uh, we've taken a lot, we have learned a lot from this and I hope everyone else has and uh, keep on, on organizing more of this and we'll always be there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, uh, Mbemba or Barnaba, uh, member, yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Galia, for this. And um, as I said, I think this is the start of a, a discussion to reconnect. Um, so there's there's always an opportunity to have discussions about uh, diaspora engagement in development. So even though, yeah, I, I think we 
sometimes um, as your questions will ask probably an, probably an expert even working in countries of origin, but I think we, we have to um, put that at the back of our minds that the diaspora is actually in, in two folds. Like uh, sometimes this is not uh, seen by most of the players. Diaspora is here as taxpayers. We contribute to the development aid, but also we send more remittances back home. We are actually contributing more to the development and this has to be recognized. In some places it's, it is, but in some places it's not. And that's why if diaspora is actually left out in those decision making and things like that, they actually felt that what is going on here. So these are some of the things we need to actually ask our questions. It's a very, it's something to ask, but I think people have the right also to be critical about things. So we have to come to a common ground, but this is something that we need to take forward. But I also think like actually change a lot of things. This is our new reality, but also we need to also think about what is happening inside the countries to the people that live here totally different from the majority. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Barnaba? Yeah, Galia and, and all, all participants, thank you very much for, for having such a very, very good dis discussion. Uh, and I hope we will we'll continue with that. Um, I want to say that uh, I, I like what uh, Suzanne as well was saying about that. I, I hope given the energy we have and having seen some familiar faces today, uh, at that that at that at that webinar that they are still involved and they're very active i hope that yes i mean there is issue that from time to time there is a more little bit competition and collaboration given the structure how those things works and i hope that it could it could be changed somehow that there's a more cooperation uh, uh, than sometimes uh, Competing with each other, uh, because there's a there's a plenty of fields we can we can we can we can we can dive into and collaborate, and especially I think in this world when when this whole Zoom meetings we can we can meet up without technically leaving our 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 houses, uh, that we can build networks and better communicate to those means than before. Uh, I hope that at some point we'll be able to meet up face to face. But at the same time, to have that opportunity, if I can't attend or somebody can attend somewhere a meeting in Mullingar or in different country, we can participate that through through uh, such webinars, for example. Uh, that's very promising. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, so um, I don't, Suzanne, do you want to say some more words or? Uh... Maybe just just one one few things. What I'm I'm hearing today is is idea of we've got a real opportunity to reset. Um, I'd like to think we've also got an opportunity to reimagine. Um, but let's also remember there's more in discussion today that unites us than divides us. So uh, thank you for organizing this and uh, looking forward to future conversations. Thank you very much for this positive note. And thank you to all our wonderful participants for making it, for being here, for preparing. And thank you to the attendants who are still with us for uh, dedicating your time and uh, well have a good weekend and uh, we'll keep on the struggle and i hope to see you around whether on a webinars or in real life uh, so um, take care and uh, and bye bye thank bye thank you thank you bye bye thank you thank you i would be the last to leave the head of the ship. Bye. <laughs>